The Chessable Masters concluded four days ago, so you probably are fully aware of the results, but what you might be missing is the fact that today, Anish and Magnus went at it on Twitter again, which is why I'm making this video. We're going to take a look at their final Blitz game from their first mini match. very, very instructive, and we'll also talk a little bit about what the hell is going on between these two. So, Magnus started out uh, allowing a Nimso and then playing the move A3, which is not an extremely popular uh, selection against the Nimso Indian, uh, essentially making Anish clarify the situation and play c5. This is, uh, this is all standard, but at this point, uh, in a 5 plus 3 blitz game, Magnus disconnected for almost 2 minutes. And when he finally reconnected, it was something like 5 versus 3, and he played the theoretical move e3. So he gave Anish 2 minutes of time odds. After the moves knight c6, bishop d3, d6, knight e2, this is all, again, mainline theory. Why is black spending so much time crawling with the pawns? Well, he traded off his dark squared bishop, so he replaces all the pawns with dark squared pawns. And also not to mention that the guy that has the two bishops wants to open up the position. So this is designed to shut down the center. You know, whichever way you take, uh, we're, we're going to have stability in the center of the board. Now, normally white castles here, but in true Magnus Carlsen style, he plays knight to g3, which is not a theoretical move. Actually, I only saw three or four games in the database played with this move, so Magnus takes the game out of theory. Uh, Anish does something principled, plays the move h5, which actually does make sense because he wants to go here and this knight won't have a comfortable square. Um, and we have h4. So he's preventing that move from happening. Queen e7, and now Magnus goes for a very kind of standard idea when you have the two bishops. You try to open up the position for one of them. Uh, so he pushes in the center, forces this knight back. It didn't have to go back there. It could have maybe went to d8. And then plays e4. Now this bishop is bad, but this bishop is good. Uh, Anish here plays a maneuver that looks like it's not going to make any sense, which is bishop g4, f3, bishop c8. Why did he do that? Well, he's essentially arguing that this move is, you know, it's a big commitment for white, and sometimes you can do that. You can make a move that induces a pawn move, and then you back the bishop up to where it was. Uh, in this position, it doesn't really do much of anything, and bishop g5 still happens. Queen c7, and now you might say, well, Magnus, what the heck is this move? You've got the two bishops. This is the one bishop you have that black does not have, and you trade it. What? I always say, don't give away the bishop unless you have a really good reason, right? Well, in this position, th the really good reason is that these pawns are now weaknesses. Magnus Carlsen breaks a, lot, a big rule here. He trades off his dark squared bishop and yet has five pawns on light squares, which doesn't make any sense. But he has an idea. Castles. And the idea is to go f4 and use this open file, use these open lines. In any closed position, you are looking for a pawn break, and the move pawn to f4 is extremely strong. Knight d7, pawn to f4. Even though that will allow the knight to get here. He takes, for a moment, Anish has tripled pawns. Now Magnus does not take on f4, he instead goes for h5, uh, because, you know, the knight and the queen obviously both defend that square. So, knight takes pawn. And now, if you give Magnus the opportunity, he's gonna play rook f4, knight f6, and win all the pawns. So Anish says, okay, I'm gonna play this, you can take with check, but my king is pretty safe, uh, and I might actually just use this to counterattack you. Rook takes f4. For a brief moment, uh, Magnus is up two pawns, okay? Uh, but Anish has a plan. Knight g6. That attacks the rook, that attacks the pawn, and now it also frees up the queen to get to e5. And again, we see sort of the, 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 pro the, the problem with white having a light squared bishop but having all these pawns uh, on, on light squares is that the e, you know, the, the e file, the whole, all the dark squares are, are, are up for grabs. So Magnus here says, well, exchange sacrifice time. Uh, I get a lot of questions in, you know, wh when do I sacrifice an exchange? Well, uh, it, it, it depends. I mean, sometimes you sacrifice an exchange when you're killing off your opponent's most active piece, and that's exactly what he did. That knight, and now this position, black has no active pieces left. Rooks are endgame pieces, and right now black's rooks are completely out of the game. It, so is white's bishop, but at least white is going to be the one bringing the rook to the party faster than the rook on h8 or the rook on a8. So Magnus plays g4. The idea of this move is to play g5 h6 and basically lock in that knight on f6 forever. And you can't play rook g8 because the knight controls. 
So here Anish plays the only move in the position that's basically, you know, giving him any hope. How does he activate one of his rooks? Try to find it. I'll give you five seconds. Okay. A5. That's the only way. Uh, and it looks pretty ridiculous, but you have to play rook a6. Like, that's the only way. It, it, I mean, honestly, it is, it, it is quite literally the only, the only way, because um, white is just too quick here. He's got too many passed pawns. He's just got way too much initiative. So he plays a5. Okay, so g5, rook a6, rook b1. And remember that question about when do you sacrifice an exchange? Well, sometimes you can do it to kill off your opponent's most active piece and the bind on your position, right? Rook takes f6. Fantastic move, right on time. Now the h5 pawn is hanging, and he takes it. Magnus here. Okay, now we have a rook and bishop endgame, and white is up a pawn. His pawn structure does not leave a very good impression, uh, but still, there is, you know, there is some hope uh, for, for Magnus to break through here. So what do you do in the endgame? When you have rook and bishop versus rook and bishop, look for the weaknesses, rook b5. Okay, and each goes for the weaknesses as well. This is one of them. This is another one. Rook h3. Counterattacking. You just cannot defend all of this. Okay, bishop e2. He takes. Rook takes a5. Now Anish can't take the pawn, but he can maybe play this move. He can also play b6. So what does he do? Plays rook e3. Fork. Bishop moves out to h5 and attacks f7. And here, Anish actually missed white's main idea. It's not actually to take this pawn. That was a smokescreen. And he thought that after takes, takes, he would be okay. The actual problem is this bishop. Rook a8. And all of a sudden, it is impossible for black to defend that bishop. There's all sorts of ideas coming. Like this, d6, d7. So watch this. King c7, d6. Trying to deflect the king away from the bishop, king d7. You don't have this because the rook is covering. So he takes. Rook g4, check. The idea of this check is to force the king to the f-file, play here, and then win this pawn. So king h2. Rook f4 anyway. King g3. Why king g3? Because after this move, you bring the bishop back. And there, again, because black is so passive, he can't defend the position properly. So rook f4, bishop g4, and now you have to give away the bishop. So when you have rook and bishop and some pawns versus rook and some pawns, the, you know, you should, if you're the guy with the bishop, you should really do your hardest to preserve one of the pawns, because rook and bishop versus rook is incredibly difficult to win. Um, well, let's see if, if he was able to do that. You know, Anisha took the pawn, now he's got one pawn left. Bishop b7, rook c3, king moves up, Anish pushes his pawn. Bishop comes back to centralize, he's looking to play king f5, rook a6, pick this pawn up. It's very good that Magnus is still defending this pawn. Rook c1, rook a5. Cutting off the king, rook f1. Okay, so there's always threats, and in, 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 even in the endgame, there's still some tactics. King g3 to avoid, rook f4, bishop f3, and now instead of e4, which would hang a rook, Anish centralizes, the rook now cuts everything off, rook d5 is not a problem anymore, and this pawn is about to promote. So Magnus brought back the king uh, uh, with king f2. In this position, uh, Anish Giri had an absolutely a, just an unbelievable defensive resource which is so difficult to see so so difficult uh although the the way that i can break this down for you uh is that you you've got to look to you know use what you're strongest in and he's got a pass pawn in this end game and he could have tried to push it and make a queen he should have played c3 the reason he played rook d3 in the game he should have played c3 there was an absolutely unbelievable resource and here it is. So first things first, if king e3, just c2, and rook a6, and you can stop this pawn, but black is going to win your a3 pawn. And then we know that rook and bishop versus rook will probably be drawn, although it's very difficult. Rook a6 is the more challenging move. Now watch this. White wants a setup where he gets his rook here, right? So king d7. Now if rook c6, black has e4. So he has to play here, and then there, and then there. Now watch this. King c7, bishop b5. Black to move and draw. Again, take your time. Black to move and draw with rook c4. With, uh, uh, and I basically just spoiled it, but it's okay. I already gave you enough time. Rook c4, quadruple x clam. And you can't go here. Look at this. Takes promotion. But it's not winning for black because there's bishop d5. And then after this trade of everything, obviously the player's 
We'll trade off pawns and it will be a draw. An astounding move, rook c4, which Anish missed in time trouble, and the game ended with Magnus just bringing his king slowly toward the pawn, winning the e-pawn, defending his a-pawn, and king c3 is coming, and Anish just resigned here because he's going to lose the pawn, and rook bishop and pawn versus rook is just... It's a very, very different story. Well, an unbelievable game uh, for Magnus Carlsen. This did seal him the victory uh, in the first mini-match. Uh, there's another video uh, that, I, that I posted, um, it, their first game of the second mini-match, and there's going to be a third one coming. But take a look at their Twitter drama. Links are in the description below. You can click on my face to subscribe if you haven't already. Appreciate all of your support. Much love, and uh, I'll see you in the next one.